The first speaker is Professor Kenji Fukushima, and he will talk about the rotating relativistic matter and the angular momentum. Okay, Kenji, uh, please. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, very nice introduction. And also, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, the organizers for arranging uh, this meeting mm -hmm. and uh, this complicated situation. So I'm actually uh, talking about the uh, effect of a rotation on the relativistic matter. So the, the name of this session is actually the phase diagram and the rotating uh, effect, but uh, I'm not talking much about the uh, phase diagram because uh, there are lots of uh, technical difficulties. And uh, actually my emphasis is uh, put on that kind of the uh, technical difficulties, why it is so interesting and why it is still so difficult. Okay. Um, how to, ah, uh, yeah. Yes, so uh, here is actually the motivation uh, to investigate the rotation effect. And so you might uh, have heard of the exciting news uh, from uh, star collaboration in a LIC experiment. Uh, they confirmed a very so, uh, rapidly rotating matter created by heavier in collision. And so you can easily imagine that if you have uh, two nuclei uh, to, uh, and then, so if they collide uh, with some finite impact parameter, then uh, what you have here is a hot and dense matter uh, that have uh, that may have some uh, orbital angular momentum L uh, together with the magnetic field. This magnetic field uh, could be created by the spectator or uh, this charged matter rotate and so uh, this supports the magnetic field by itself and so uh, this effect could be external or internal. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, what you have is a very interesting matter that is very hot and dense together with very strong orbital angular momentum and magnetic magnetic field. So this is very interesting. And uh, so if you see uh, different fields of physics, this situation is not so uh, peculiar, but you can find this kind of analogous situation everywhere. So this system is quite ubiquitous, I must emphasize here. Uh, for example, if you see uh, many of uh, astrophysical phenomena like neutron star mergers or the supernova, then uh, you can actually easily find uh, such a system with a, a rotation and magnetic field. And also in the field of uh, condensed matter physics, uh, in which you can do the, uh, some um, uh, experiment under very well control, uh, then so you can find some interesting uh, the, uh, uh, analogous uh, objects like uh, electron vortices. So uh, I will briefly explain what, what it is. And so uh, the nice point uh, of this uh, physics is that if you have a great idea uh, motivated by this experiment, you can also test that theoretical idea uh, in condensed matter physics experiment that is usually under better control uh, than heavy ion collision and vice versa. So in such a way, so we, we, we can exchange our ideas and export and import the ideas from and to other fields. Okay, so this is the motivation. But as I said, uh, uh, of course, uh, my time is limited and so I cannot cover uh, all interesting features. And so my talk is focused on uh, four different things, uh, but different, but uh, closely related. The first one is uh, the rotation plus matter uh, creates some, something interesting. And the representative example is a topological current or some, some, some current induced by the combination of rotation and the existence of matter. And then there was actually the puzzling feature. Oh, what? A puzzling feature. And so I will introduce how I understood uh, this puzzle. And then I will briefly show you uh, some, how to say, demonstration of the calculation of the polarization around the black hole. So this is a rather academic uh, thing, but anyway, interesting theoretically. And then I will come to the technical difficulties, as I told you. And this part, I believe that the uh, Kazuya Mameda, uh, he is one of the speakers in this session, uh, will go into uh, more details. And so I will quick, quickly uh, look over the problem, okay? And then uh, I will change my gear uh, into some somehow different subject that is electron vortices. So this is actually a very nice system you can see in condensed matter physics. And then, uh, so this uh, consideration uh, gives us a new insight uh, to, to, to understand the chiral magnetic effect uh, 
from a different perspective. And also, oh, this system is a very nice system to see uh, where we have technical difficulties. So I, I will show you some breakdown of the calculation that you can see very explicit way. So, that, so this is a really a nice system. I like it very much. And the final topics is actually the angular momentum uh, carried by the vortex. Vortex is actually another uh, well-defined system that carries a magnetic field and also the orbital angular momentum. So this is really the uh, physically and the theoretically well-defined system, ideal system to investigate the interplay uh, between the orbital angular momentum and the magnetic field. So this is very interesting. Okay, so this is my uh, talk plan. And uh, the first topic is, uh, why is it, what? Yes. Okay, the first topic is the rotation uh, plus matter. And so, uh, so actually during this workshop, we have already seen uh, many times this kind of formula uh, that is actually the chiral vertical effect that some uh, actual current is induced by the presence of the matter, typically uh, some term proportional to T squared or mu squared times the uh, angular velocity um, that is uh, the omega. And in fact, uh, from, the, uh, from the technical point of view, so you can actually compute, uh, so this kind of uh, uh, current uh, by changing uh, to the uh, rotating frame or performing the coordinate transformation. So to introduce um, the uh, angular velocity along the Z direction, you can actually change the coordinate in this way. So X, Y axis uh, can be rotated. Or so you can actually change the frame uh, with this uh, new coordinate X prime and Y prime. And then you can introduce this omega along the Z direction. But uh, so uh, my puzzle was, uh, so this J is actually the component of the vector. And I know that the uh, transformation law of the vector or tensor uh, must be the same as this uh, coordinate transformation. And so if this J was zero or at some point, then the coordinate transformation should not change uh, zero from, you know, uh, so zero, you know, the, the tensor transformation is proportional to the original component. And so if this is zero, then zero is zero, right? And so uh, I was already, I, I, I was uh, pretty, pretty much puzzled uh, by this uh, feature, how the rotation could induce uh, the current, even though the current, uh, the, the index of the current should transform as a tensor component. And so uh, I was puzzled uh, over years and eventually, I think that the the, uh, the, uh, the the key to puzzle to solve this puzzle is actually the feature of the Christopher symbol. The Christopher symbol. So this is in fact the expression for the uh, Chan Simon's current associated with the uh, chiral anomaly uh, in the presence of the uh, non-trivial uh, uh, geometry. So this is a, a mixed gravitational chiral anomaly. But anyway, so the point is the point is. So here uh, you see uh, this current is actually uh, expressed in this way in terms of a Christopher symbol. And this symbol is not really a tensor. And which means that if you do that coordinate transformation, especially associated with the rotation, you get some extra term that is not proportional to the original tensor component, but uh, something additional. And in this way, actually, this part is shifted by the uh, angular velocity omega. And in this way, for example, uh, if you pick up a term proportional to omega, uh, this is actually the current uh, expression. Uh, and actually, the rest of the part, apart from this omega part, uh, this is uh, expressed by the uh, Riemann uh, uh, tensor and so uh, this is in fact uh, quite analogous to the uh, field strength expression. Uh, you know, the, in our case of the chiral magnetic effect, what we have is very similar. That is the uh, mu five, the uh, the actual chemical potential, the chiral chemical potential times the magnetic field B, and B is gauge invariant object. Even though the uh, A five uh, zero was not gauge invariant, but once that gauge field is replaced by the uh, uh, chiral chemical potential, what you have is a physical expression. And in this way, actually, the, once this Christopher symbol is shifted like this and this is replaced by the angular velocity, then uh, what you have is completely physical. 
And so in this way, you can interpret this as a physical current. And so this is how you get the current from zero uh, by the coordinate transformation. Okay, in this way, uh, you can get, uh, so this kind of the uh, current, the physical current. And if you apply this idea using such an expression of a chan simons current, now, so this can be regarded as physical current, and then uh, you can use the car metric to compute uh, this uh, current. And then what you have is very interesting. The car metric is actually the uh, black hole with a rotation. So this carries uh, some non-zero angular momentum. And so you can uh, actually find uh, some interesting feature of the actual current. That is, you see this x, y, and z is actually the rotation uh, direction. And so you can expect some current along this z direction. But because this has some uh, structure, uh, what you have is not really only the current, but some pattern of the current. That is, so along this z direction, or if you see the center of the black hole, then you can find uh, actually uh, the current along z direction as expected from the uh, something like chiral vertical effect. But uh, uh, as you see from here, um, the, the, uh, the current uh, changes its sign from positive to negative and positive and negative and so and so on. And so if you see the angular uh, distribution, this is actually the radial distribution. And the angular distribution is uh, more uh, difficult to imagine, but this also has some interesting pattern. And so this is in fact uh, some kind of a local polarization. And if you know uh, what was measured in the heavy ion collision in nuclear physics, actually the local polarization is a big puzzle in the community. And so I think that uh, this kind of consideration may give us some hint to understand the local polarization, especially if you apply the holographic uh, QCD description uh, to consider the polarization phenomena. And so this is actually the real black hole, I mean the car metric. But uh, if you consider the holographic QCD model using uh, such uh, the uh, higher dimensional uh, car metric, uh, then I think that uh, so you can investigate this kind of a polarization phenomena by computing uh, uh, J5 or J, uh, the, you know, the uh, actual current. I think that maybe the uh, next speaker, Mei Huang, uh, will give a talk about the holographic QCD description. So, uh, so this uh, consideration might have some relevance to the next talk, I guess. Okay, so this is actually somehow the uh, academic part of the discussion, but now uh, let me come to more real uh, discussions, real calculations. So, um, if you want to compute this kind of a physics, then what you, sh you should solve is just a the, the, just a the Dirac equation uh, in the rotating frame, as I told you, and that was formulated by this uh, the paper. The uh, actually the chairperson is one of the, uh, the uh, proprietors, and the, uh, the the next next speaker, the Kazia, is also involved, and we actually studied this project uh, from this you know the rotating the, the project related to the rotation uh, from this paper. But anyway, uh, so uh, the covariant derivative is uh, actually generalized uh, to include uh, the Christopher symbol, uh, or no, the, uh, the gamma mu, sorry, the gamma mu. And this gamma mu is given by the um, uh, spin tensor, uh, the, the spin connection, uh, spin connection omega. And that is given by the Christopher symbol and also uh, Press in terms of the fear bind. So actually, you should need the fear bind, not only the metric, but the fear bind information is necessary. And actually, uh, the choice of the fear bind corresponding to some metric is not really unique. So, um, so in our work, we chose uh, this form of the fear bind. But anyway, the physical result should not be changed by this choice. And what you have, uh, after all, is a shift of the Hamiltonian. If you consider the Hamiltonian in the rotating frame, then the, this energy is shifted by the term uh, proportional to the angular velocity times uh, orbital, the, the total angular momentum, z. So uh, because now the angular velocity is taken, to, uh, taken along the z direction, so uh, now the z component of the total angular momentum is picked up here. But anyway, so from this expression, you can see a very interesting analogy uh, between the rotation and the density. If you have the chemical potential, for example, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the chemical potential makes such a shift, uh, like the chemical potential times density. And of course, the density uh, changes its sign 
or the chemical potential effect uh, changes its sign for a particle and an antiparticle, while the rotation does not change the sign. That is actually the major difference. But apart from that, what you have is very similar. And in this way, actually the rotation can be identified as a sort of density, not a discriminating particle and antiparticle. So this is a very interesting feature. <coughs> And from this, you can imagine that you can actually draw the phase diagram uh, as a function of uh, omega, as well as a function of a chemical potential mu, right? <clears throat> but uh, so you should be very careful at this point. Uh, that was already pointed out by uh, Professor Bielenki many years ago. So uh, even though this uh, rotation effect is uh, like uh, chemical potential effect, the energy is shifted. Uh, so this cannot actually induce a condensation. I mean, if the chemical potential exceeds the lowest excitation uh, energy, then you can form the condensation. That is a mechanism of the Bose-Einstein condensation or the existence of the Fermi degenerated matter. But in the case of the rotation, uh, the, uh, there is a subtlety. So if you see, for example, the distribution function, this is actually the copy from uh, Virenkin's original paper. And if you see the distribution function, this omega is the energy and M is the uh, uh, Z component of the uh, angular momentum and capital omega is actually the uh, angular velocity. So the notation is a different, uh, a little different. And then you, you, you may naively think that if omega is large enough or M is large enough, so this uh, minus third, this shift uh, may exceed the energy and then you have the uh, sign change. Uh, that is actually the onset of the Bose-Einstein uh, condensation formation, but it doesn't happen. Uh, in reality, that is because of the causality. <clears throat> if you impose a boundary condition, then actually this energy is discretized like this. So the momentum, sorry, the momentum is discretized. And so the energy is gapped by this discrete uh, momentum. And this uh, energy discretization uh, associated with the existence of the boundary is always bigger than this, uh, the, the energy shift. And so the sign change would never happen. So that was actually briefly discussed in the footnote of uh, Virenkin's uh, the, uh, very famous paper. So this is actually very important uh, observation, even though this is actually written only in the footnote. <clears throat> so uh, the bottom line is that if you rotate the QCD vacuum or QCD matter, the only the, sorry, what, uh, how I can, uh, yes. So the, uh, the only the rotation uh, cannot change the vacuum structure uh, so you cannot form the new condensate only by the rotation. And so that is actually a very clear for the bosonic case. But what about fermionic case? Actually, the four fermions, uh, you have spinner. And the spinner has um, four components uh, corresponding to spin up and down. And the spin up and down means that the spinner component or the uh, angular momentum carried by spinner component, uh, that may have a different uh, orbital angular momentum. Okay, so uh, as you see uh, from this expression by Virenkin, so this is actually the nth root of the Bessel function. And uh, so that uh, feature uh, corresponds to some um, uh, uh, orbital angular momentum, so some order decomposition. And so if the L is different, the orbital angular momentum is different by spin up and down, then it is impossible to apply the same boundary condition. And so for fermions, there is a very uh, so subtle feature, but this problem was solved uh, by this paper uh, together with one of the speaker of this session. And then uh, anyway, the bottom line or the final result is actually in the same way as the bosons, uh, for the fermions also, uh, there's no such excitation. And so the only the, uh, uh, the rotation cannot make the Fermi degenerated matter. So the rotation does not affect the matter at a zero temperature, okay? <clears throat> so this is actually the bottom line. So this is actually uh, very important if you want to consider the phase diagram as a function of omega. Uh, otherwise, your calculation is easily broken down 
or you can pick up some unphysical contributions. So, okay, so to consider the uh, phase diagram as a function of omega, you should impose some uh, appropriate boundary condition and then you have to take care of discretized momentum. So this actually makes uh, the uh, theoretical calculation very, very involved. <clears throat> okay. And so actually uh, to see the difficulty, the very nice example uh, can be found in the electron vortices. What is electron vortices? This is in fact, uh, not really the topological vortex, but uh, the angular momentum decomposed uh, mode. So if you see the electron beam like this, then you can actually uh, make some special filter to split it uh, into a, a different um, mode with a, a different uh, orbital angular momentum or some quantum number corresponding to the orbital angular momentum L. So this uh, kind of experiment is now possible. This is actually very, very, very interesting because actually, you know, the uh, rotation itself is uh, not so easy uh, to control experimentally. But once you have such a uh, quantum uh, mechanical state with uh, non-zero or large uh, orbital angular momentum quantum number, then this is a much, much more uh, tractable experimentally, right? And so the, uh, you don't have to rotate the system but you can actually decompose uh, the, uh, the quantum mechanical state into the state carrying some, something like uh, the rotation. That is L. So uh, you can actually solve the Dirac equation uh, in the presence of the magnetic field. And so you should decompose a mode uh, that are labeled by the uh, orbital angular momentum uh, quantum number L. And this is actually the result. So this is already a little bit complicated expression involving some special function. But if you are familiar with the calculation of the magnetic field, this is actually quite common um, expression uh, with uh, generalized Laguerre polynomial. Anyway, so this is the result. And so uh, in such a way, you can actually uh, the, the, uh, identify the spin up and the spin down and the particle and the antiparticle spinners. And then, uh, so you can actually make a plot like this. So this is a wa S wave density and the D wave density. And because uh, the D wave has a node at the center. And so you can actually see this kind of a ring structure. And this is in fact the experimentally seen if you perform the electron vortex experiment. So this is quite interesting. And what is more interesting is this. So you can actually uh, make the decomposition of the density and the chiral density, uh, mode by mode, spin up component, down component, and also the antiparticle component, and uh, you know, and and so on, and so on. And if you do this, then uh, the interesting observation is that uh, so this so this is if you compute also the current, the vector current, mode by mode, then uh, this is actually what you find. So if you compute the Z component of the Z is actually along the direction of the, of the magnetic field, then this current is uh, actually identified with the uh, actual, actual density, mode by mode, okay? And then uh, this is actually the minus sign here, minus sign here, that is a little bit confusing part, but anyway, uh, this is a really nice proportionality relation between the vector current and actual density. Okay, so this kind of relation is really surprising because what we know from the chiral magnetic effect is that, that the vector current is proportional to the actual chemical potential mu5, not the density, okay? But in this case, if you do the uh, model decomposition, you can see the direct proportionality between uh, the current and the density. And this uh, comes from the low uh, dimensionality nature. If you see the uh, low dimension theory like a one plus one dimension, then actually you can see this kind of uh, correspondence. And so by doing the model decomposition, you can effectively uh, have the uh, uh, dimension reduction to see this beautiful relation. But more surprising is that this relation exists only between vector current and actual uh, density. 
not the, uh, not between actual vector and the density. That is a chiral separation effect. We know that only the chiral magnetic effect is uh, anomaly protected, while the chiral vertical effect or chiral separation effect are modified by the mass effect, and so it is not really uh, anomaly protected. <laughs> and that feature is very nicely seen uh, in such a way by the model decomposition. This is really su surprising. Okay. <clears throat> And now, uh, okay, so the, uh, what is actually interesting uh, from this consideration is that uh, if you do this kind of uh, thing, then uh, you can actually easily find very interesting physics. That is, if you have the magnetic field, strong magnetic field, and also if you have the rotation, then uh, you can find that uh, there is a preferred, uh, uh, preferred, uh, the, okay, the either, the, the, the particle or antiparticle, uh, one of them is preferred by this combination of a rotation and a magnetic field. That is because uh, if you have the magnetic field, very strong magnetic field, the lowest random level is dominant. And the lowest random level exists only for one spin state. And then this, if the, this is spin state or the, uh, has the, uh, consistent direction with the, um, the system rotation, then that is actually energetically more favored, right? And in this way, you can expect some non-zero density uh, as a result of the coupling between rotation and magnetic field. And this uh, mechanism is pretty similar to the surface pumping, if you know the Floch theory. Anyway, I don't have uh, enough time to explain what it is. But anyway, so uh, let's try to find this final density effect from the explicit calculation. Okay, so that is actually a quite a simple task. Once you know such a mode decomposed uh, expression of the density, right? And then, so this uh, omega j is actually uh, the chemical potential shift associated with the rotation, as I told you. And so in this way, actually, you can count the phase space volume to actually uh, read uh, the density. So this is very simple task, right? Uh, but of course, the phase space volume must be uh, measured uh, in the presence of the magnetic field. And so uh, you have to consider, uh, you have to count the number of the uh, random levels uh, divided by some volume. Uh, so this is actually the, uh, related to the, some normalization. So this is a little bit uh, technical the detail. But anyway, the point is that, uh, so this part, this part you see, this is just a phase space volume, okay? And then, uh, from this expression, so this is very simple, right? This is a heavy side theta step function. And so uh, what you get is just this summation. And so uh, from this Jz, uh, you pick up uh, just the total angular momentum J. And that is L plus one half. And if you consider this one half part, that is a spin part, then you can recover uh, this expression that was first found by the anomaly consideration by uh, uh, Koichi and E. Uh, so, so this is, is a complete uh, same expression, but uh, you see uh, this L part. This is actually problematic because uh, so this is this is, uh, J Z runs uh, up to the upper maximum value proportional to the S system volume, and if you have such a term, this is proportional to S squared. So this uh, orbital part is actually proportional to S, uh, right? And so this is divergent for an infinitely large system. So this is thermodynamically unstable. And so what is actually the origin of such unphysical divergent contribution? That is, of course, the absence of the boundary. Okay, you should put this system into the finite box. So the finite size effect is really crucial. Otherwise, you get such unphysical divergence associated with the system volume. So I think that uh, more details will be uh, talked by uh, Mameda. But anyway, so uh, so this is a very so clear uh, demonstration uh, how you have the technical difficulty in such a calculation with a magnetic field and rotation both. And so uh, in the same way, uh, yes? Can you, sorry, uh, is, is that possible for you to finish in a couple of minutes? I think we are oh, yeah, running. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yes, yes, okay. yes. So uh, now, uh, so you can actually uh, see the same uh, kind of a breakdown in the computation of the actual current. Mm. And so, oh, anyway, 
Well, uh, okay, now, now I have to uh, finish <laughs> my story in a couple of minutes, but uh, okay, the last part is actually, uh, so my own ongoing work, uh, so that should be published very soon. And so this is actually, the physics is, uh, is quite uh, interesting and simple enough. So the idea is that the magnetic vortex, or that we know that the superfluid vortex carries uh, the quantized uh, topological uh, angular momentum. And the question is what about magnetic vortex? And the magnetic vortex has a magnetic field inside. And then if the uh, magnetic vortex is charged, then it has also the electric field. And then the magnetic field and the electric field, uh, they actually perpendicular to each other. So you have the pointing vector and from that, you can get extra contribution to the angular momentum. And if you want to consider the angular momentum conservation, you have to think about such extra contribution. Uh, no, the, uh, yes, okay. So this is just a detail of the uh, description of the uh, vortex. But the, the point is that you should actually di distinguish this canonical angular momentum uh, that is uh, just a derivative and the kinetic angular momentum that is computed by this uh, covariant derivative. And then the difference is given by such a pointing vector contribution, as I told you. And so that is this one, electromagnetic contribution. And if you add them up, okay, if you add them up and then you have a very good, a very beautiful cancellation between uh, major contributions. And what you have is actually uh, some uh, conserved uh, angular momentum. And from that, you can actually uh, classify the type of the vortices. Uh, so this is actually the, uh, the, uh, the uh, type two, the vortex in the uh, type two superconductor. And in that case, you have the background field and the background field has non-zero um, angular momentum. But if you consider the vortex in the vacuum, that is relativistic nielsen olesen vortex, then there is nothing, no background field that absorbs the finite angular momentum. And so there is a, a clear cancellation uh, between two um, angular momentum contributions. And also you have the topological insulator. And in that case, the angular momentum is uh, quantized in the fraction, fractional way. So this is very interesting physics. And that is also explained by this extra contribution coming from E cross B. Uh, anyway, so in such a way, uh, we can make some classification of the magnetic vortices, class one, two, three. And that uh, the complete discussion will be given in this forthcoming paper. And uh, now it's time to summarize my talk. So as I told you, the rotation plus magnetic field makes really rich phase structures. But uh, uh, to do the uh, concrete calculations, putting uh, the, the boundary at some finite size, finite radius, that is crucial. Otherwise, you get unphysical divergences everywhere. Uh, and so uh, this is actually the uh, technical obstacle or going into this direction. But the one uh, good way to avoid that, that problem is uh, we can consider the electron vortices that is more of the composed quantum mechanical state or the magnetic vortex. That is actually a quite uh, interesting system. And a well-defined system to investigate so you can investigate the same physics. Okay, so that's all, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the very interesting talk. I think now we can pick up some short questions. Uh, Maxim, please okay, ask hi. your question. Hi, Kenji. Hi, Kizon. Hi, hello. Yeah, hi. hi. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting, exciting talk. Really very nicely done and uh, just uh, enjoyed it very much. And uh, I just would like to give um, uh, just two notes here. The, uh, indeed, uh, since we rotate the system and uh, we have to respect the velocity of light, then the system should be becoming smaller. Then necessarily we make a, we work with the finite volume and uh, in some directions, and that's why boundary conditions are important. And uh, with Shinya Gonyu, we studied this question, also consider it not your conditions by different ones, and really found that even phase transition in NGL model uh, depends on the so-called theta angle at the boundary. So we clearly see the physical dependence on the boundary conditions on the on the on the on the okay boundary conditions of of uh, the on the um, phase diagram. It was in 
200, I think, 2016 or 17. So I will send the reference because it's really, we do really see the dependence is extremely important and very difficult to do. So indeed it's complicated. And uh, this was just comment about uh, similar research. And the second one is indeed uh, uh, with these uh, interactions, uh, uh, with, the, um, uh, with the interplay between magnetic field and the finite density. Yes, so I'm also writing a paper on that, but from different respect, correctly different respect, not without vortices, but uh, for finite density. It's, it was inspired by paper by uh, Zahed and Lee, which was done about pion condensation uh, recently, I mean, about two years ago. So it's, I would like just to express that it's extremely interesting research and uh, it needs to be uh, followed, uh, yeah. So I would like just to ask you to comment about boundary conditions, but probably it will be done uh, in the talk uh, by Kazuo and Mameda. Probably so, but your vortices, do they depend exactly on the boundaries or what kind of boundary conditions do you use? Because it's extremely important. Yes, I completely agree. So the, uh, yes, the, the, the boundary condition is extremely important. And so in our case, uh, we uh, impose the uh, hermeticity uh, boundary condition. That is to make the uh, system uh, hermit. So to conserve the probability, which means that there is no uh, probability flow uh, across uh, that boundary, but uh, that is not necessarily the unique choice. And in fact, uh, the, uh, maybe you know that the um, uh, Fukaya, the, that, is, uh, that is person, the, uh, the Fukaya actually imposed uh, the different type of a boundary condition on the lattice. And so he investigated the realization of the Atiyah Singer theorem or the, some anomaly property uh, in the finite box system. And so he argued that uh, such a boundary condition is really sensitive to the realization of the anomaly. And so actually, if you are interested in the surface state, uh, and so the boundary is extremely important. I completely agree. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I also see several questions and comments in the chat, but I think we can keep this comments and questions to the discussion session. So Kenji, please answer those questions in the discussion session. Okay, okay so uh, thank you, Kenji. Thank you again. Let's uh, move okay, thank to you the very much. 